Okay, we'll start with this. The aftermath of the Australian domestic showdown between Shotgun Shannon O'Connell and the still reigning IBF bantamweight champion Ebony Bridges. Post-fight, Shannon O'Connell stated, you win some, you lose some. Finally touched down back in the beautiful land down under after the fight. Congratulations on successfully defending your title, Ebony. We put on a hell of a fight for the crowd before the stoppage. Respect to which Ebony Bridges herself replied. Thank you for the congratulations, Shotgun Shannon O'Connell. Glad you got home safe. Hopefully, you can put some respect on my name now, and you can see and feel that I am much more than a blow-in skanky stripper who only cares about social media and showing my tits. I'm a legitimate and very deserving world champion, a student of the sport and game, and will continue to dominate and become undisputed. Parting thoughts. The rivalry between Ebony and Shannon, it is over. And Ebony Bridges sent shotgun Shannon O'Connell packing with her tail between her legs after some very catty behavior in what was the buildup of this match. I was confident that Ebony Bridges was the genuine article and she could stop. She could win this fight. I picked her to win and that's what she did, though in the buildup of it, Shannon O'Connell, like a lot of people, tried to trash Ebony Bridges, insinuating that she was just a blow-up doll, a skanky stripper, a gimmick, and I said it before, I'll say it again here and now. I don't think a skanky stripper would have flown halfway around the world, relocating. I don't think a gimmick fighter would have done that. I don't think a gimmick fighter would have enlisted the aid of Mark Tibbs. Won the blue belt from an experienced champion in Maria Cecilia Roma. No, I don't think a gimmick could have done that, but a serious professional, a serious pugilist, well, Shannon O'Connell found out the hard way that that's exactly what Ebony Bridges is. And now Ebony, post-surgery, post-fight. I don't think a lot of people realize that going into that Shannon O'Connell fight, Ebony Bridges' right hand was injured. She needed surgery, but she had put it off for months because she knew if she gets surgery on that hand, she's going to be out for a while. She didn't want to lose any momentum being sidetracked by that nagging injury, so she put it off and powered through it. The same right hand she busted up Shannon O'Connell's face with. She wasn't going to let that injury stop her, and it didn't. Here and now, post-fight, after having been interviewed by Boxing King Media. It appears she has had the necessary surgery on that right hand and it's under a cast. What that communicates to me is that Ebony's gonna be out for a while. We may not see her until the second or third quarter of next year, the spring, summer months, going into the fall. She's taken care of a mandatory challenger, so that should keep the IBF off her back for a while. But you saw what she said. She means to become this division's undisputed champion, and she's got the right promotional outfit behind her to do it, to at minimum get that chance, get that opportunity. Matchroom very recently signed Nina Hughes after Nina upset the apple cart for then WBA champion Jamie Mitchell. Nina is the WBA champion now, and Nina, like Ebony, she's a matchroom fighter. At minimum, that is one unification match, one alphabet title that is within arm's reach for Ebony. It's a fight that can happen. Though given that Ebony Bridges is gonna be out for a while and she will be coming back from surgery and subsequent rehabilitation, I don't get the sense that Ebony Bridges' very next fight is going to be a unification match. I get the sense that she may take up a voluntary title defense ahead of a unification match. We may see her two times next year, barring unforeseen circumstances, illness, or injury. We might see Ebony Bridges in action a minimum of two times, two times next year. Her first fight of the year will likely be a voluntary title defense, an easy one. Because she's coming right off the of surgery. And her second fight will likely be a unification match, and that unification will likely be with the winner of Nina Hughes versus Shannon Courtney, former WBA bantamweight champion Shannon Courtney, who was out of action a while. She had an injury of her own that needed mending. Needed tending too, and she has since returned to action. I intend Anticipate that very soon we're going to be seeing a fight between Shannon Courtney and Nina Hughes. And the winner of that fight will go on to face Ebony Bridges later on 
next year. The other two champions, Yuli Hang Luna, WBC champion of Mexico, Dina Thorsland, WBO champion of Denmark. Dina, Dina's got a fight coming up early next year in February. Yuli Hang. I don't know what the hell she's got going on, but beyond Dina Thorsland's next fight in February, provided she stays WBO champion, and I think she will, I don't see why those two champions shouldn't fight each other. At the start of this year, I expected that we would see at least one unified champion crowned in today's bantamweight division, a densely populated, talent-rich division with no shortage of good fights to make. I hope that next year we see at least one unified champion crowned. Dina Thorsland is going to be hitting the ground running at the top of the year in February, leaving the rest of it open for her to have other fights, significant ones. Hopefully at least one of those fights is a unification match. In other news, Floyd Mayweather very recently broke his silence on the Javante Davis split, his split from Mayweather Promotions. You know, Javante, he was basically their flagship fighter. His relationship with Mayweather Promotions was something akin to Canelo's relationship with Golden Boy Promotions before he left them. He was their star fighter, their top-earning athlete. Floyd said, I have always been a gentleman. I have always been respectful. There's nothing like taking a kid that came from the same background as you and helping them and putting them in a position to become a multi-millionaire. You meet a kid, he just came up to you for an autograph, you sign the autograph for him, then I tell him in a few years, when you get older, I'm gonna work with you and make you a world champion someday. Years later, I started working with him, helped him, pushed him to be great, and if he feels like he has grown wings and can fly, become his own boss, more power to him. What specifically made Javante Davis want to leave? Even if he didn't go far, because he still is fighting on the Showtime platform. But what specifically made Javante Davis want to sever ties to Mayweather Promotions? I remember when that news broke, Javante Davis himself made some mention of Floyd just going off doing his own thing. He said he didn't blame him because if he had accomplished in his career all the things that Floyd accomplished in his, he'd be the exact same way, that he can't fault him for what he's doing. But he did mention that Floyd was just off doing his own thing. Did that bother Javante Davis? Bother him enough that he wanted to leave the promotional outfit? Is that all it took? That Floyd wasn't around as much as you would have liked him to be? Floyd continued, I didn't get into the sport of boxing after I retired to not want to see fighters grow. If he feels like he can surpass Floyd Mayweather or be the next Floyd Mayweather, I'm here to push you. Go for it. On the face of it, Javante Davis may have severed ties to Mayweather Promotions, but he didn't go far. He's still on the Showtime platform, and because of that, I feel like the door is still open for them to rekindle their relationship. I said it before that news broke, that even if he does part ways with Mayweather Promotions, he won't go far. He'll likely stay on the Showtime platform, he'll maintain a working relationship with Al Heyman, and that's just as good as him being a Mayweather Promotions fighter. It's still the same decor. The biggest change that came out of all of this is that you don't hear as much from Leonard Ellerby. It's a bit hard to wag your finger in Eddie Hearn's face, say that he's a joke, he's this and he's that in America when you just lost your flagship fighter, really your only fighter that had any kind of drawing power. Or I'm sure that Mayweather Promotions might have one or two or three other guys signed to their promotional outfit. They might. Those guys aren't to that promotional banner what Gervonta Davis was to that promotional banner. And if Gervonta, now that he's gone, should he stay away, not rekindle a working relationship with Mayweather Promotions? Well, I don't imagine that Leonard is going to have all that much left to do. I don't imagine we'd be hearing more from old Lenny. Now that Gervonta Davis is gone? No, I don't imagine he has all that much to do at Mayweather Promotions. I don't imagine he has all that much to say. If Gervonta Davis were to re-sign to Mayweather Promotions, happy day. Happy day for Leonard Ellerby. I told you guys for a long time that in spite of Leonard's candor, he really is a small-time promoter. One of several small-time promotional outfits that make up the PBC as a whole. And they their infrastructure, their network. It's Mayweather Promotions and Tom Brown, TGB Promotions. That's who's promoting Javante Davis's next fight. TGB. There's TGB, there's Samson Lukowicz, there's Sean Gibbons, who represents Manny Pacquiao Promotions. But none of these smaller promotional outfits are powerhouses like a Matchroom or a Top Rank or even a Queensbury. They're not. They are a series of smaller promotional outfits that make up the PBC as a whole and their inner network. Without Javante Davis and without Javante Davis's fights to promote, 
What does Leonard do now? I don't think that uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather was at the Mayweather Promotions offices micromanaging and being a, a helicopter mom to Leonard, to Gervonta, to his fighters. Really, I think that for the most part, Floyd entrusted that Leonard would be his point man and take care of business, take care of things while he went off just, you know, doing his own thing. Where does Mayweather Promotions go without Javante Davis's fights to promote? They can't turn Roly Romero. It's a bit of a running gag, you know, Roly. He has a, a bit of a cult following, but certainly not a big enough following to make him an adequate replacement for Javante Davis. That in Javante Davis's absence at Mayweather Promotions, Roly ain't the guy that's gonna fill his shoes. And even still, the door is open for Javante Davis to go back because as stated, he didn't go far, you know. He may not be with Mayweather Promotions right now, but he's still with Al Heyman. He's still fighting on Showtime. Javante is not as business-minded or enterprising as his former mentor, Floyd Mayweather, Oscar De La Hoya, you know, those kinds of guys, those kinds of fighters that have a mind of their own. Javante Davis doesn't strike me as that kind of independent and critical thinker. He ain't got a mind for business. You can barely get a coherent sentence out of that kid. You say that, at minimum, leaving Mayweather Promotions is, you know, one less hand in the cookie jar, but he's substituted Leonard Ellerby with Tom Brown for his next fight. The registered promoter for Davis versus Garcia, Hector Garcia, is TGB Promotions. So is it really one less hand in the cookie jar? You think Javante Davis himself, you think he knows how to promote a fight? Not in the fighter sense of the word, the promoter sense of the word. You think that Javante Davis is a bona fide promoter? You think that he knows how to put together a show? put together a card broker a content deal independently with a, a major network like a showtime a fox and espn is he really a promoter in the promoter sense of the word you know the answer we all do which begs the question if this kid really ain't business minded and he's really not that enterprising then why did he really leave mayweather promotions what drove him away what specifically and what is so different now that he won't go back leonard's not in the picture Neither is Floyd. Is that what he was trying to get away from? He just doesn't want to work with those guys anymore. Well, then what the hell did they do that led him to that conclusion? Pandora. I mean, as of right now, I've, I've heard nothing more than everybody else have heard. You know what I mean? So WBC ordered it. I've heard nothing from nobody else about it. You know what I mean? They ordered it. And, uh, it is shit. It is what it is. I ain't, I ain't talked to nobody. I ain't heard no nothing from nobody yet. So, I mean, I don't really talk to Al. You know that that much. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a guy that uh, that that pressed himself on talking to Al. Or, I've I, I've heard nothing more than than the people that have heard about that fight. But that's I, I know, fight you would want. I, I will fight anybody. To be honest, to be honest, I'm not ducking no. I'm I'm I will fight anybody. I like it's like it's it's, it's nobody in the world I want to fight. So when Luis Arias is calling my name out, I asked to fight him. And they told me no. When this person called my name, I'm like, okay, well let me fight him. They're like, no. You know what I mean? So I'm like, what the fuck? Like, you know what I mean? So understand that it's not me saying that I wouldn't fight these guys. You know what I mean? That is former WBC junior middleweight champion Tony Harrison, who has since expressed an interest in standing in for Jermel Charlo opposite the ring Tim Zhu. We all know that Jermel, he very recently suffered an injury to his hand, and he's not going to be fighting Tim Zhu early next year. Tony wants to take him on. Tony wants to stand in Jermel's place, taking to his social media saying, somebody at Tim, I'll fill in for Charlo so he ain't got to go on another six-month layoff. It's conceivable that the PBC may elect to save the date, save that January date, have Tim take on Tony instead. It's a fight that was talked about some months ago, though some months ago the proposition was for Tony to fly down to the land down under, fly down to Australia for the fight. Needless to say, that didn't happen. Because the fight with Jermel was set to go down his stateside in the United States. If Tony stands in for Jermel, you won't have to fly anywhere. Interestingly enough, Tony Harrison is already under orders by way of the World Boxing Council to take on unbeaten up-and-comer Southpaw, the Towering Inferno, Sebastian Fundora. The virtue of facing Sebastian is the same as facing Tim Zhu. Those are both guys that are in line to fight for alphabet titles. Sebastian is on the cusp of fighting for the WBC title, and Tim is on the cusp of fighting for the WBO title. The virtue of fighting either one of them is the same, with the difference being that 
Tony Harrison's fight with Sebastian Fundura was being eyed for March, whereas standing in for Jermel Charlo opposite the ring Tim Zhu, that would happen a little sooner, ahead of schedule, in January. Tony's last fight was earlier this year, in April, and he likely doesn't want to have to wait that long before he sees action again. If he ends up facing Sebastian Fundura in March, that's an 11-month layoff. 11 months is just one month short of a year, a full year's time since his last fight. So you can see the virtue of taking on Tim in January as opposed to Sebastian in March. That tandem with Tony Harrison possibly viewing Tim Zhu as being a more beatable fighter than Sebastian Fundora. You know, a fight between Tony and Sebastian. It's not saying that Tim is more beatable than Sebastian, in my humble opinion, but that might be how Tony looks at it, because a fight with Sebastian would be eerily similar to Tony's previous fight with Willie Nelson. Yet another statuesque mid-range to inside junior middleweight. Seven years ago in 2015, Tony Harrison shared the ring with the physically imposing Willie Nelson. Very tall guy for junior middleweight, and he was stopped. He was stopped in about nine rounds. Two years later, he shared the ring with yet another statuesque mid-range to inside fighter, a pressure guy in Jared Hurd, and he was stopped again. Tim Zhu, he's a pressure fighter, but he's not as physically imposing as those fighters are. It's not a statuesque. He doesn't take up as much space. He's not that big a guy. Now, Sebastian Fundora, he is. You know a lot of six foot four, six foot five junior middleweights. Both Tim Zhu and Sebastian Fundora's call and card is activity volume. They're both pressure guys. They're both gonna crowd a guy, get in his wheelhouse and beat him up from the inside out. They both do it. And both guys have been down before. Erickson Lubin knocked down Sebastian Fundora. Terrell Gachet knocked down Tim Zhu. I mean, there are parallels there. There are similarities, but the glaring difference is that a fight opposite the ring Sebastian for Tony harkens back to the Jarrett Hurd fight, harkens back to the Willie Nelson fight. Tony might view Tim as being a little bit more beatable than Sebastian because he's not as physically imposing as Sebastian, even if he is a strong puncher. No telling as to whether or not the PBC and Showtime will elect to save the date, save that date in January, have Tim fight somebody else. And maybe that somebody else could be Tony Harrison. Maybe that's what they do. Or maybe they save the date, but Tim doesn't fight Tony because Tony's already under orders to fight Sebastian. Do the PBC proceed as planned or... Did they alter the plan? We'll see.